All right, welcome to Philosophy for Flourishing. I'm John Hersey, and our topic today is how Ayn Rand got so much right. I made a new friend recently. He's a classical liberal. He's read some of Ayn Rand's works, and he's interested in her ideas, but he doesn't know much about them. And he asked me if philosophers have been trying to resolve fundamental questions for centuries and have come up short, why do you think that Ayn Rand got so much right? And this is a helpful question, I think, because it focuses our attention on the differences that make the difference between objectivism and so many other philosophies. I want to give an answer today. I don't consider this to be an exhaustive answer, but I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty good. I think it indicates the ways in which Rand was significantly different from a lot of other philosophers and also uh, other ways in which she really benefited from some other philosophers and from her context. So I think there are three parts to this. The first one is that Rand understood that existence exists independent of the human mind, independent of our wishes or our whims. It's out there, and our job uh, as, as human beings is to understand existence, to, uh, to learn about it, to learn about causal relationships, and to use that knowledge to better our lives. We can't use our minds to shape existence. Our, our whims, our wishes cannot do anything to actually shape the world. They can shape our actions and thereby shape the world. But, um, you know, we need to take action. The, the mind itself, it, its primary job is to understand the world out there. And she said, the best and briefest identification of man's power in regard to nature is Francis Bacon's nature to be commanded must be obeyed. So she had this reality-first approach, which is pretty rare among philosophers. Uh, she also said, and this is from a really excellent essay, if you're interested in this topic, I'd recommend checking it out, uh, The Metaphysical versus the Man-Made, and it's in her uh, anthology, Philosophy Who Needs It. And she said, today, this is implicitly understood. She's talking about Francis Bacon's nature to be commanded must be obeyed. She said, today, this is implicitly understood and more or less accepted in regard to the physical sciences, hence their progress. It is neither understood nor accepted and is, in fact, vociferously denied in regard to the humanities, the sciences dealing with man, hence their stagnant barbarism. And this is particularly true in the field of philosophy. The reality-first approach that we're talking about, that Rand called it the primacy of existence. Existence has primacy. Conscious does, consciousness does not. Uh, man's consciousness does not create reality. It only understands and thereby enables him to, to shape it by his action. But this primacy of existence viewpoint is very, very rare among philosophers. And this is one of the things that makes Rand pretty distinct. So just to give you a, a quick uh, indication of, of some of the ways that other people have gone wrong and, um, you know, as a fundamental premise, why they, they probably didn't get so much right. Uh, I want to just run through a few other thinkers and, and even bring this up to, um, to some things that are going on in the culture today. So for instance, let's go back to ancient Greece, Plato, Plato held that the world that we see, hear, touch, feel, smell is but an imperfect reflection of a higher realm of immaterial, perfect forms. These forms are the patterns by which all of the things that exist are created. So for Plato, uh, you know, if you, if you said nature to be commanded must be obeyed, you know, he might even agree with that, but he's going to say, okay, but it's super nature. You know, the real nature, the real world is this world over and above the world that we perceive. So if you, if you believe that as a, you know, fundamental starting premise, it's going to be pretty hard to get things right in the way that we mean right today, you know, in a, in a culture where we prize uh, scientific advance and, technological progress, we understand what right means in a way that Plato wouldn't have. Uh, we understand what's called the 
correspondence theory of truth. The truth is that which corresponds to reality. The mind is your means of corresponding to reality, to figuring out what reality is and how to correspond to it. All right, so stepping forward a little bit, um, the church. The church held that knowledge is knowledge of God's will, and you should use your mind to figure out not how to make your life great here on earth, but how to conform to God's will. And so, you know, this obviously stretches through to today. People don't take it, or most people don't take it as seriously as people did in the Middle Ages, but actually a lot of people still do. So uh, people aren't doing rain dances to, uh, to bring down the rain, but there's still sects of Christianity that prohibit things like medicine. Um, you know, a few years back, there was this guy, Jamie Coots, a Kentucky pastor, who, you know, he and his, and his sect believed that uh, the, the Bible commands you to handle snakes and God will protect you from their venomous bites. So he was bitten, unsurprisingly, and uh, he, he and his, his family refused any sort of medical treatment. They thought, well, you know, praying is all that we need to do. God will, will take care of this. The mind, in effect, whether your own or God's, is uh, primary. It is supreme over existence. The fact that, you know, there are these uh, entities called humans and these other entities called snakes and the one can bite the other and, and, and kill them doesn't matter because uh, ultimately the nature of nature, the nature of existence is uh, is changeable via via the mind, whether your own mind or God's mind. Uh, similarly, a few years back, a, a boy named Brandon Shabel, I believe he was in Pennsylvania, uh, he got uh, bacterial pneumonia, I believe, and his parents refused medical treatment. They uh, they thought that they could heal him simply through prayer, and he he died. And uh, he wasn't the first, actually, in his his family to die. His, his parents had also refused medical treatment for a two year old son of theirs, and he died as well. So these are the th types of things that happen when you think that the mind has primacy over existence. And, you know, we see these things in less extreme forms today. Uh, every time that we want others to somehow read our minds or every time that we think that wishing will make it so, we're on the premise that consciousness has primacy over existence. But in fact, existence has primacy over consciousness and that viewpoint, you can see how as a, as a starting viewpoint, that is going to uh, that is going to change the trajectory of where you go with philosophy entirely. So, you know, this was Rand's starting viewpoint: existence exists independent of consciousness, and what we need, what objectivism is, what her philosophy is, is a self-conscious method for conforming one's consciousness to the facts of reality. So if you think about it, you know, if we think about what truth is today and, and what getting things right is, well, if that's your starting premise, you are on a, a really good trajectory to get a lot right. And I think this goes to explain, you know, some of what makes Rand so distinctive among philosophers. Now, the next point <clears throat> is that she also benefited from prior thinkers. She's not entirely new in this regard. Uh, I mentioned Francis Bacon. She quoted him directly in that essay, The Metaphysical versus the Man-Made. Um, of course, she was also heavily influenced by Aristotle, and she famously named several chapters or, or sections of, of her magnum opus, Atlas Shrugged, after identifications made by Aristotle. So she says in Philosophy Who Needs It, Aristotle's philosophy was the intellect's declaration of independence. Aristotle, the father of logic, should be given the title of the world's first intellectual in the purest and noblest sense of that word. No matter what remnants of Platonism did exist in Aristotle's system, his incomparable achievement lay in the fact that he defined the basic principles of a rational view of existence and of man's consciousness, that there is only one reality, the one which man perceives, 
that it exists as an objective absolute, which means independently of the consciousness, the wishes, or the feelings of any perceiver, that the task of man's consciousness is to perceive, not to create, reality, that abstractions are man's method of integrating his sensory material, that man's mind is his only tool of knowledge, that A is A. And then she goes on to say, never have so many owed so much to one man. And she would not have exempted herself from that. So this is point two. How did Ayn Rand get so much right? Well, she relied heavily on some of the achievements of prior thinkers, and she was not bashful about crediting, especially Aristotle. Uh, so Aristotle, Francis Bacon, two huge prior influences on Rand's thinking. Another who she doesn't mention as much is John Locke. Now, she does mention the Founding Fathers multiple times, and I think if you, uh, if you go back and, and look at her writings, there, is a, there are a few places where she does explicitly mention John Locke. But John Locke's philosophy was the primary basis for the ideas that it ignited the American Revolution. Now, aspects of Locke's philosophy are problematic, and I go into these in a, an article I wrote for the Objective Standard called John Locke the father of liberalism. But uh, his, his ideas in, in the realm of politics are generally very, very solid, very, very good. And they were quoted uh, endlessly during the uh, pre-revolutionary and le- revolutionary period. John Locke was probably the most important intellectual in that period of American history and is still one of the most important today. So uh, in one place, just to give you an idea of Rand's nod to the, to the achievements of the founders and um, by extension to John Locke, she says that America's founding fathers were a phenomenon unprecedented in history. They were thinkers who were also men of action. They had rejected the soul body dichotomy with its two corollaries, the impotence of man's mind and the damnation of this earth. They had rejected the doctrine of suffering as man's metaphysical fate. They proclaimed man's right to the pursuit of happiness and were determined to establish on earth the conditions required for man's proper existence by the unaided power of their intellect. Unaided power of the intellect there, referring to the fact that uh, despite the fact that many of them were religious or called themselves deists, meaning that they believed that God created the universe but then left it, let it be, and let its laws unfold naturally. So the unaided there, meaning uh, they thought that the mind was fully competent to comprehend existence, to to understand nature, and thereby command it. Um, So this leads to a third aspect of why Rand got so much right, is her uh, historical context, her specific historical context. So Rand uh, somewhere credits the fact that she was born after the Industrial Revolution, that she got to see the fruits of the Industrial Revolution as a key, a key to her being able to make some of the very vital points of her philosophy. So she's born after the Industrial Revolution. She gets to see what man's mind is capable of creating here and now in this world. She gets to see this primacy of existence viewpoint in all its glory uh, with scientists and inventors very much on this primacy of existence premise making huge strides toward a better world and not only was she born post-industrial revolution but she was born in soviet russia and i think this is important too now She grew up in in a culture where she got to see firsthand the ideas shaping the culture. She got to see how the lack of sovereignty over one's own mind really uh, defeated one's ability to flourish as a human being. People weren't allowed to think for themselves, to express their ideas, to to act on those ideas, and they weren't able to flourish. And you can see this very well, um, you know, her most autobiographical novel, she said, was We the Living. It's her novel in which she talks about growing up uh, about characters, not herself, but actual fictionalized characters in Soviet Russia and just the extent to which life 
as we think of life as a, as a fully uh, human and flourishing life is just snuffed out by both the material and spiritual conditions of living under a communist dictatorship. So I'd, I'd recommend checking out We the Living for a picture of, of that part of her, her historical context. Um, the other key part of that is that she didn't stay there. She came to America and she saw the opposite. She saw ideas shaping a, a culture. Now, obviously, when she got here, the ideas shaping the culture were not as healthy as they, the, the ideas that shaped early American culture, revolutionary culture. But um, she got to see, to a large extent, what people with sovereignty over their own minds, over their own lives, got to do and got to accomplish. And she even got to take part in that. She was an incredibly accomplished writer. She came, again, from Soviet Russia to America and then became a a best-selling author and a public intellectual and a public figure. And she got to flourish here in America. She got to see how being able to to act on one's thinking leads to real flourishing. And shortly after publishing We the Living, she did a Boston Post interview. And I think she paints there a really eye-opening picture of the difference here. And again, one of the differences that made the difference and helped Rand get so much right. So she's asked by the uh, Boston Post to give an idea of the differences between what it means to be a woman in Russia and uh, a woman in America. So she paints this companion picture of a Russian girl named Olga and her American sister. And Olga lives with four people in a three-room apartment. They have no tub. She has coarse underwear, dry fish to eat, bread. Sometimes they eat horse meat fried in linseed oil. She spends her nights at political meetings, and although she has a boyfriend, she has basically no time for him. And her American counterpart, Kitty Cotton, she's called, a a day in her life is is entirely different. You know, she wakes up at eight sharp and jumps in the shower. She puts on silk stockings and a saucy frock, Rand says. She has for breakfast coffee, orange juice, toast. And then her boyfriend shows up and picks her up in a, in a roadster. Uh, for lunch, they go out. She goes out for an ice cream soda and a sandwich and a piece of cake. Or some di- sometimes she gets French fries and chicken salad and, and coffee. And then after a hard day's work, she goes home, gets a, you know, a fresh shower and a change of clothes, puts on lipstick and goes out for dinner or a drive or to a dance. So... Why am I why am I going into all this detail about Rand in, in this interview? Well, she saw in very concrete form the differences when people are or are not able to act on their own judgment. This led her to a profound understanding of the 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 differences in political and philosophic systems. So again, I don't think this is an exhaustive answer to the question how Ayn Rand got so much right, but I think in general, these are the the differences that make the difference. So she started with existence exists. She benefited tremendously uh, from the work of prior thinkers, work that she both had to understand and then identify as good and then build off of the the work of uh, Aristotle primarily, but also uh, she understood the, the value of Francis Bacon, John Locke, and a few others. Um, I didn't mention St. Thomas Aquinas, but uh, she, she credited Aquinas with reviving Aristotle's thought uh, during the Dark Ages and thus bringing about the, the Renaissance and thereafter the Enlightenment. And then her specific historical context is the third factor. She grew up after the Industrial Revolution in Soviet Russia, and she saw the tremendous difference uh, that that ideas made in a country uh, founded on the principle that man has a right to his own life here in America. So uh, one more time, existence exists. The th- thinking of of several prior thinkers and her specific historical context. These are the differences that made the difference and enabled Rand to get so much right. So I hope you found this helpful. 
If you're enjoying this show, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Definitely helps us out. Also, we'd love it if you'd give us a rating, five stars preferably. And if you're enjoying the show, you might also like Craig Biddle's book, Loving Life, The Morality of Self-Interest and the Facts That Support It. We're actually giving this away as a free ebook to our listeners. Just go to objectivestandard.org slash lovinglife and sign up to get a free copy of the ebook. That's objectivestandard.org slash lovinglife. Until next time, keep fighting the good fight and living the good life.